Thanks for coming to our uh, presentation, Life is Better Stream. This is uh, a lot of us sharing our very practical experience about our journey moving to a uh, streaming type of uh, analytics. So without further ado, I just want to give you a little overview, you know, a little preview of where we're going to go, you know, a little bit. We'll talk about a little bit of our background, uh, the company, and what, so that you get kind of a little context, a little bit of our influences, why we, how this actually came about. Uh, I'm going to reminisce a little bit, so you'll have to put up with that. And then I'm going to actually then let us get onto the really good stuff with Kevin over here. So uh, who is FIS Global? We're, we're probably one of the largest companies you guys have never heard of. We are a financial technology company, and we build a lot of financial products that banks will come and purchase. So a lot of banks usually leverage our technology in order to deliver just basic you know, checking, accounting, you know, all that type of technology. And as an interesting aspect of it, our customers are actually those banks, those credit unit, those payment processors. But those customers of banks then in turn become our customers or the people who bring us those data points or those analytics uh, viewpoints that we can look at. We actually have a rather interesting origin that we started on the digital finance side and we're actually currently part of the FIS Digital One program. And as an interesting aspect of that, is the very fact that we started working with a lot of digital channels. So to put that into more layman terms, mobile channels, you know, the mobile finance, you know, you're using a banking application on your phone, the web pages to check your online banking, a, lot, a conversational using Alexa to ask for your account balance. Those are the type of channels that we actually started working with. Now, our first, real use case of this, the product that really kind of inspired us, our little influence, was our product called Metrics Intelligence that started, well, it seems like a long time ago. <laughs> but it was primarily at the beginning really a business intelligence type application, really focused on giving those billing type analytics and giving those very standard type of reports out to our customers who are engaging usually in the mobile, inside our mobile channel. But what we, what you find when you're in like a mobile channel or dealing with those types of data points is you get a lot of hockey stick growth. And that led us to down the journey of bringing in Apache Spark to leverage and manage against that scale. But as we actually started using this, as we started using Spark, we began to realize that there is a lot of new potential cases for it that we'll start, that I'll talk about in just a minute. About Two years ago, we gave a uh, presentation that was about, you know, that was more about the batch-focused processing of data. And it was wrapped around behavior-driven design and how you implement that on Apache Spark so that you can create very testable, very reusable type of pipelines. And I put this, uh, put this slide inside that presentation. And since, you know, the oldies are goodies, I, I decided to revisit it because when I was looking at it, the original we actually, start, we actually talked about like how once we move from batch to streaming, the context change about how that data means. And so as an example of what that means is if we were to say what your normal type of analytics, which are usually tracked monthly or daily, like daily active users, if you all of a sudden say, how do we go to streaming and how do we bring it to more real time, you begin to connect a richer wealth of information or different types of metrics. So I like to use this example that if I saw something funny or a really good joke and I wanted to tell Kevin about it, you know, I would just go and I'd hit my phone. And we could say, take a measurement of that and say, funny joke told by Aaron, right? But if we were to do that on a daily active basis, you know, 12 funny jokes to Kevin per day, it kind of has a different meaning meaning that the type of metrics begin to change with the current the context and how they're relevant in real time. And that was actually what began to inspire us to actually start going downstreaming. We wanted to start understanding how to create those very interesting use cases around behavior analytics that could really begin to unlock the insights. So obviously when we start bringing into this different type of context around data, we can actually increase the value around data because we're able to create these interesting new scenarios or understand them a lot better in the real time. So our data value starts going up at even 
just because it becomes more available. We're able, able to get the data in in real time. People are able to grab in real time rather than wait for it all to come in at a certain time. It also begins to shake your user expectations, and I think we'll talk a little bit about that, because all of a sudden, those moments is the data's coming in real time, and you're experiencing things in real time. So I still acknowledge that business intelligence, our original use case that we actually started with metrics intelligence, is still very, still very relevant, but we turbocharged it, and we were able to bring in a whole wealth of new information by just being able to be able to start doing real-time data enrichment. Uh, for those of you who might have seen our other FIS talk yesterday morning, which was uh, that pursuit of happiness, we talked about conversational AI, and we actually talked about data enrichment in some of our slides. And this is an example that we were talking about was how you can actually take on a mobile, uh, on a mobile phone, you can basically hit a button and generate an activity, and all of a sudden be capturing these conversations and linking them across multiple systems. So the data enrichment opportunities also become more real when you can start connecting across multiple systems. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Kevin, who will bring us to all the really good in-depth experience that we found. Okay, so Aaron did a good job setting up our business problem and the product that we offer. And I'd like to go through um, kind of a journey of our technical um, enhancements and our progress over the years. And then at the end, we'll do a live demo. So. Um, initially, we started out with an application that was producing a lot of data. So primarily, this is designed around uh, server activity logs, so similar to Apache server logs for a website, um, those kind of things. And we wanted to take that and augment it with some offline databases, which help us understand the banking industry in general. And so when we tried to do this with the traditional development approaches, um, you get all of the long-running applications, the stack trace timeouts, and nothing really works very well. So we were fortunate enough for this um, effort to be occurring right as Apache Spark was coming out, which led us to our first um, batch-oriented architecture. And so in this diagram, we were able to take an internal extraction process and pull all of the server activity logs, um, all of the related internal data for a given day, and generate this big um, input zip file and so this allows us to execute an Apache Spark program in a batch mode um, to process one day's worth of data. Um, and then we're ultimately doing all the data parsing, the extractions, the aggregations, and pushing that into um, AWS Redshift for our data warehouse. And the um, diagram or the screenshot that Aaron showed you of the in Insights uh, product, M Metrics Analytics, um, that's what we use to serve this data to our customers. And so this is really cool because we were able to deliver functionality that people never had before. Um, they already knew that people were downloading and installing their apps, but they had no idea what happened after that. So this helps them understand the customer's journey throughout the website or the mobile app, um, the types of features that they were engaging in or not. Um, and it was also very straightforward from a technical perspective. So we knew that based on the size of the daily file that we're processing, we could pretty accurately guess the size of the Spark cluster. We'd need to pull that off. And you also would know about how long it was going to take. Um, on the challenging side, we're generating metrics based on historical data and historical events. So it's not very, um, it's not something you could do at cer certain use cases with, such as uh, fraud detection or if you wanted to try to provide immediate insights into uh, feature adoption or issues with a new release. Um, another thing that we found is that over time, if you have access to all of your data in one place and you can perform very complex calculations without any sort of penalty, your code gets a little bit complicated and difficult to maintain in the long run. So because of these reasons, we evolved to a streaming architecture. Um, and so the main big part initially here is that we no longer have to extract data. We no longer have to have this secondary operational process that's very difficult to understand and manage. Um, now we just have a mobile application or um, any of our apps being publishing log activity to us directly from those devices. And so that goes into uh, AWS Kinesis Stream, which we then connect a Spark structure streaming job to, to do all of the actual processing. So the, the metrics become much more compartmentalized and you have to reshape the way you're generating those aggregates to make it um, more immediate, which ultimately simplifies a lot of them. 
And so the big, the big pro here is that we're understanding what's happening right now. So that's what customers really want to know moving forward. Um, they're less interested in what happened last month. Um, and we're able to do a lot more uh, different use cases. So we allow customers to enable certain features for their, for their banking customers. And so um, executives at these, uh, these national banks want to know, you know what's taking off, what's, what's not, and that helps them adjust their marketing and their um, consumer interactions. And so when you can tell them that immediately without waiting, it's really quite beneficial to them. Uh, the challenges that we found is that performance is very different. So you now have an application that's always on. So you need to adjust for um, an increase or a decrease in the, the demand for your workloads. Um, <clears throat> you also need to find ways to effectively monitor those and make that more alert driven and less um, something that you're expecting somebody to babysit and watch the entire time it's running. Um, and then finally, the, the data relationships. Um, many times we'll need to validate some data as it, as it arrives to us, uh, make sure that you're able to relate it to the proper um, banking entities and those kind of things. So that data may or may not exist um, locally to your system. So I'll go over some of these challenges in more detail um, in the demo and don't feel like you have to follow along too much. So this entire demo is available on GitHub. Um, it's got instructions for how to install all of the dependencies to run this entirely yourself, or if you want to take the cheat sheet version, um, there's a pre-filled notebook that you can just download and, and look at what the results were. So I'm gonna switch over to that now. Okay, so the demo that I chose um, is related to some information published by the SEC. And so I chose this because we're not able to give you our financial data, um, but this use case is very similar in that it also uses Apache uh, web server logs. And so if you're not familiar, um, the SEC has a website called Edgar, and this allows you to go and view all of the public filings for companies. So if a company um, has a merger or has a, a big new announcement that requires SEC filings, you can go to this website and you can search it and see all that material. And so um, to give you an idea of the data and how it looks, um, they do publish a schema. Uh, we're not gonna look at all these, so don't worry, but the main elements I want to key in on are um, this CIK, which is a central index key, which is a unique identifier for a company which is assigned by the SEC. There's also the date time elements and a code which re represents the HTTP request um, status code. So 200 if things went well or other codes if it didn't, which we'll get into. Um, and the actual data itself is, is here. It's got an obfuscated IP address of the person making this request, but at a very high level, this is just a, a log that somebody like myself made a request to this web server. It, it tracks what I tried to look at and what the result was. And so I'm gonna go through an example of how to do some, some metrics off of this in the traditional batch mode. And then the second part will go into how to do that, those same metrics in streaming and some of the things you might wanna look out for and be aware of. Um, so here I'm just adding some more um, date elements that will allow me to do the aggregates a little bit easier. And finally, uh, trimming this down to just the elements that we really care about for the sake of this demo so it's a little bit easier to look at. And so now for the first metric, um, all of the data in this batch mode was downloaded from um, June 30th of 2017, which surprisingly was the most recent data they had on the website. Um, but so what I'm gonna do with this first me measurement here is just take a look at all the different status codes that occurred on that day and decide which ones occurred uh, most frequently. To just get a general view of the type of request and response going on at the SEC. And so you can see that um, the majority of these were uh, status code 200, 68% of them, so that's a good sign. Um, but after that, there's a, quite a flurry of other status codes that are not really obvious what they mean. So this would be an opportunity for us to enrich this data with a source that would tell us um, what do those status codes indicate. And so luckily, there's an organization that maintains that information, um, Internet Assigned Numbers Authority. So downloading a data file from their website um, this is an example of data that is locally available to your organization or to your Spark um, worker nodes. And so 
it'll give you a listing of a code and then a description of that code. Um, and in some cases, it'll even specify a range. So let's make that a little bit easier to work with and just flatten the data out. So this way we can build a, a simple lookup table where you give it a code, you get a description back. Um, and so this is a case where we're dealing with a very small static data set. So we're not expecting that the way web request and response works is gonna change all that often, hopefully. And so it's a great example where you might wanna use uh, broadcasted variables. So what this does is it creates a local copy of the data, it pushes it to all of your Spark worker nodes, and that data is immediately available for your tasks when they run. So it's just a, a minor um, performance enhancement. And then I wrapped a user-defined function that allows me to just say, um, here's a status code, let me know what description this links into. So with that helper method, I can take my previous aggregate, um, I can call my UDF, and I can get a result that is a lot easier to understand for most stakeholders. So uh, 429, I now know, means that somebody was um, attempting too many requests in a certain time period. And so this type of metric in a batch world is a great example of something that is interesting, but it's not going to change my behavior as an organization. But if I knew that I was getting a lot of these types of requests in a given time interval, more than usual, I might want to go and look into that and figure out, is somebody trying to attack my website? So similarly, we can take a look at the activity um, broken down by hour, just to get a feel for uh, what normal activity looks like on, on this particular day. So it's you know, pretty normal, and then it just drops off in the last hour of the day. Um, maybe a more realistic use case would be to filter on a specific error code, like an internal server error. Um, and here I can see that it was normal until something, something happened at the 14 hour, and that's another case where knowing that right when it occurred, you could, you could tell if there's something to really go investigate um, and, and take action on. And so the second example of the batch mode here um, relates to the uh, central index key. So we wanna know what are the companies that everyone's talking about because maybe there was this big new announcement that you can go check out and have a potential investment around. And so the SEC will tell you that you know, organization 1100663 is all the rage on this day, but that makes no sense to anybody because it's just an internal identifier. So in this example, um, I've created a simple um, API call representing an external data source. Um, you give it the identifier key, and it simply returns back the name of that organization. So since this is just a demo, I'm calling the URL directly. If you were to do this in your own applications, you definitely want to cache the results of external data sources. Um, I would recommend using your own caching system outside of Spark because you don't want to necessarily tie the duration of your um, caches to the way that your um, structured streaming job is running. It, it'll all depend on your business case and the type of that data and how often it changes. And so if I now use this UDF with that same aggregate, um, you can get a much more uh, accurate visual of which companies those were that were being um, talked about. There's not data for all of them, but you know, having the data that is available definitely helps. Um, so doing this in structured streaming would be much more useful for the reasons that we mentioned. And in this example, we're going to publish um, this same data into the system using uh, Kinesis data streams. So um, there is a uh, Docker container that allows you to run a Kinesis data publisher locally on your computer. And so what this does is it just says whenever a file lands in this local directory, it's going to parse that file and publish the data directly to your Kinesis data stream. And all these instructions are in the um, GitHub repository if you're interested. So as that data arrives, we will begin to see it appear here in this Databricks notebook. Um, and all I'm doing is I'm selecting the raw data as well as the casted um, data string, which you'll see in a second, arise by default in binary form. And so this is a really good um, example of um, AWS Kinesis forces a static schema for data that gets published into those streams. Um, for structured streaming, that's a really good thing because um, when you're using structured streaming and publishing data to it, if you later on change the schema of that data, you're going to need to migrate um, your checkpoint location. And so that's the location that um, helps resolve a lot of the fault tolerance um, behavior. So doing the 
um, auto retries on records that may have failed if your application crashed. But if you have a way to make that schema always static, you never need to worry about those breaking changes. So if I scroll over here, um, this data column is uh, nothing that is useful at all in, in its native format. Um, but in the casted version, it's probably small to see here, but it's really just a CSV um, delimited record that represents one of those log um, messages that we saw earlier in the batch format. And so within my processing, I can just create a simple UDF that knows how to parse that into a strongly typed object called log. And um, from there, I can begin to create the real logic around how to process the streaming data. So I'll just walk you through what this is doing. Um, it's connecting to a Kinesis data source. You could use Kafka or um, a file location. There's a lot of supported sources of structure streaming. Um, I'm telling it the name of the Kinesis data stream that I've been publishing data into. And then I'm parsing my log so I, so I know how to use that data. Um, another good point here is that in a real application, you'd have the time that an event occurred in the real, real world, but since my demo is using data from um, 2017, it doesn't make sense for me to rely on that date time for my demo. So it also lets you know the date and the time that this record arrives to my Kinesis data stream, so I'm treating that as my time of the event. And so you'll see where that um, works out a little bit later here. And so then the way that I aggregate my stream here is I'm, I'm taking a look at all of the records uh, broken down by the code um, and everything that's occurred within a one minute interval. So basically I wanna know the number of records of each status code that occur in every one minute interval. Um, and the important setting related to this is the watermark. And so um, structured streaming will automatically um, account for late arriving records. So if a web server log occurred 10 minutes ago but didn't get transmitted until right now, um, as long as I'm inside of my watermark uh, interval here, structure streaming will automatically insert that aggregate into the correct um, time window for you. If it occurs after one hour, then it does not know about that record when it comes to your aggregates. So um, you can choose a higher number here, but you wanna be careful because that does have a um, performance implication. So structure streaming is tracking all of that state um, on your driver node, and if you choose a extremely high value, that's definitely gonna slow down your cluster. Um, and then finally, it will use that same uh, UDF to translate the code into a description. So another example of how you can take data on a stream and use a local data source to enrich it. And so while I've been talking about that, we've had all of these intervals start arriving. So you see this 200 interval here, the um, orange barrel begins to increase because it's the current interval that it is processing. Um, so every time a micro batch completes, you'll see the data refresh. Um, this is an example where if, if you were using this type of approach for looking at your status messages, you could see that you know, your responses of a certain code will, will fall into a certain average over time and one minute intervals might not be what is appropriate for your use case, but you kind of see where I'm going. If your error codes all of a sudden spiked, you know what to do immediately. Um, and also a, a cool thing to note is that the stream I'm setting up, I'm just calling the display function inside of a notebook. So that'll let you just see what's happening in real time. Um, in a real application, you wanna write this to a long-term storage location. So that's what this next cell is going to do. Um, it's going to write it to a parquet file. Um, and this is where you'd specify your checkpoint location, um, which will track things uh, based on the message broker you're using. So since I'm using Kinesis, Kinesis data streams, it will track the um, sequence number of each record. So it'll keep track of which records have been processed through successfully, and if something fails, it uses that offset to know where to pick up again. Um, also, the trigger will allow me to say, before you start processing this data, um, I want you to wait 30 seconds for data to start arriving. So you can tune this to what works best for your use case, but if I only care about um, aggregates around a one minute or a 15 minute window or whatever my use case is, um, it doesn't necessarily make sense for me to try to process things every eight seconds or whatever my micro batch um, process of time is. And then the second use case here, so talking about the, the popular company use case, um, this has one of my favorite features of structure streaming, which is the for each batch feature. And so all of, the, all of the code leading up to this is doing the same thing as the previous um, application was. 
Let me just run a couple cells and I'll come back because that'll be useful. Um, but then when we get down to the write stream, um, I'm calling for each batch, which says that I can take a single streaming source of data and I can do multiple things with it. So in my case, I want to generate two different aggregates, one around the code and one around the uh, company identifier. And so it's generating both of those aggregates using whatever settings I want and writing those to Parquet files. Um, this is another technique that you could use to write to a custom sync. So if you have like a proprietary database that you're working with, or if you have a database that just doesn't have a native Spark connector, you can put any code you want in here. Um, since I'm using the Scala version of Spark, I could put uh, Java libraries inside of here if I wanted to. So there's really a lot of flexibility. And then the, the two cells after this I just set up are um, simply reading from the Parquet output directories. So it's kind of a, a way to just visualize what's happening as that data gets written. So it's um, functionally got the same effect as the previous um, approach that we used, but it's just a way to, to do this without having to set up two separate streams or without having to do any duplication of the data that's arriving. And then similar with that um, company aggregate as well, uh, it's doing the same thing down here. And I am displaying the company ID and the, the status codes up there, but um, the graphs do have access to other data. You know, if you'd rather show that description, um, it is still being enriched and enhanced and it just doesn't look as pretty. But. Okay. All right, so um, to recap on that demo, the three things I would really remember to have you focus on, um, one is do not make your stream more complicated than it needs to be. So you can always go back and make it more complicated later. So it's, it's important to know about all these settings, but if your use case is something that would fit under a batch-oriented job or a streaming job that runs at very slow intervals, then um, try to slow it down and make it a little bit more uh, basic and simple to, to maintain. Um, two, with the schemas that you're using, um, keep them static if at all possible. So um, data that people publish to us changes all the time, but if you fit that all into a single data column in your overall schema that's being used with structured streaming, you're protected completely against the breaking changes there. Um, and three is plan for downtime. So whether you're taking down your stream to update your software, um, or if your cluster crashes, it's just something that is going to happen eventually. Um, so rely on your message broker to archive all the raw records as they arrive, and then build a process that allows you to publish those back into your stream, um, have that operational workflow laid out. So uh, structure streaming has the, the retry logic for records that have made it that far into your streaming process, um, but just be aware that it's always better to kind of err on the safe side there. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, we have 12 minutes remaining, so I think we can take a bunch of questions. Um, anybody, any questions? Uh, we have two mics. If you can come over here. Hi, how are you? Hey, thanks for the talk. Uh, real quick question. You mentioned planning downtime. Your last bullet point, and one that's interesting me um, as I go through streaming life cycle. You say plan, plan for downtime. How do you bring down the stream cleanly? Yeah, uh, good question. So um, within the stream, there is a, a class called the stream listener. So you can hook into you know, when your batch completes or, or a lot of different events within that life cycle. Um, I would recommend having almost like a, a flag that your system knows how to recognize so that if you're trying to, to bring down your stream without just crashing it and tearing it down, um, you could do something that would recognize a certain setting within your, your environment and then be able to gracefully shut down the stream that way. So the Spark um, context will have methods on there to be able to terminate the stream. Spark context. Yes. Mm -hmm. Those are the same mechanisms that have existed in the session context forever? Uh, yes, that's right. Okay. I think that's it. I didn't see you actually using data frames. You guys are 
comfortable with structured uh, data sets as, as your sort of currency in the stream? Yeah, I, I like it because it gives you the strongly typed um, object usage. But um, yeah, they, they ultimately rely on the same underlying engines. But yeah, my preference is the data sets. A lot of people have been saying that there's performance penalty associated with that. OK, I, I haven't noticed, but it's, it's possible. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Actually, I have four questions, okay. The first one, okay, why you guys choose Kinesis instead of, you know, use Kafka? Sure, yeah, so our, our environment has been built on AWS. For, so for us, it was a uh, choice just because it was um, fitting well into the rest of our environment, um, but that we did not analyze um, Kafka, so it, it's no knock at all on the stuff that Kafka can do for you. Okay, okay, good. So second one is, uh, what kind of the window size do you choose, okay, the usual, okay, the window size for the streaming? Yeah, so in the demo, we were just doing, you know, the one minute um, aggregate windows, but um, within our use cases, Aaron can maybe talk on this better, but our metrics are generally um, going at the hourly level. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any more insight on that? We, we try to round up to the, to, to the hour, but uh, because we haven't uh, really gotten the amount of user feedback to say go lower than that. Okay, yeah. And third question is, okay, I, I just found your architecture, okay. Uh, after, you know, uh, MapReduce, you go to the data warehouse directly, right? Yeah, from your architecture, first, oh, first the, page, yes. the batch architecture? So, but usually, okay, uh, if you go for that one, this one concern is IO block, right, okay. For some slow data, uh, slow database. I don't know what kind of database you choose. Okay, the first one. So for the data warehouse, it's like the yeah. So you see, the, you should the kind of you you mention the data warehouse, right? To still oh, for yeah. the final yeah, point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It goes eventually to like a data warehouse. Come in this case, uh, since we are quite addicted to AWS, we actually use Redshift. Oh, yeah, I see. Yeah, yeah. So I used to. And, and actually, the beautiful thing about Redshift is the very fact that we have Spectrum underneath there. So we'll attach glue on top of it. So we register our data catalog into glue. And then we can just natively just pass through through Redshift. And then if we want to make the, stru the, the structures static, usually we'll pet. We don't do that in the near real time. We'll usually have like a job at the end of, at the, end of the hour that kind of sweeps everything up, reaggregates it. And then we use like a, a D3 type, a D3 JavaScript to actually render anything that's below that hour so that we can just go directly down and just kind of look at the, because again, addiction to AWS, AWS Athena gives us APIs that allow us to just go direct down right onto the S3. So as Structure Streaming brings it in, we're able to just kind of go, all right. But uh, yeah, if you choose the uh, rest of that's two issues, okay. First one, I think, you know, you have used batch to do a pen. Otherwise, it's very inefficient, based on my knowledge, right? So you have to put this another, like, streaming, and whatever stuff, right? The before, and you, it's really, uh, I think it's very inefficient to write from the, you know, output of the map to use to the, to the, you know, uh, retrieve directly. You have to batch all the, the records together to do the pen, particularly do update. It's almost mission impossible to do small, just you know, uh, small numbers of record update because it's very inefficient. Mm -hmm. So what we do, we just we need to use that like data migration service. So I just want to get a little bit more the detail about okay, if you see, if you use the, some large shift, how to connect with you know the output of the map reduce from from Spark. Sure, yeah, maybe if we could take that one offline. Um, Aaron has a, a lot of experience with Redshift. I think okay. we might get into some of the low-level weeds on that one. But if you, if you have time, we'd love to talk to you about it. Uh, okay. Yeah. okay, thank you. Yeah. Hi. Uh, in one of the slides, I saw that you guys are passing the HTTP status code to the executors to you know, just correlate data. Have you guys tried, you know, if it's a lot, much larger uh, data that you want to refer to, have you tried map with state or something like that? Or uh, if you want to look up, uh, in, uh, also you call the API to look up the, the ID of a company or something like that, right? So there's always an I/O involved in, over there. So your your task, the the time required to finish your task increases, right? So any optimization you guys did with that, or I just want to. Um, I haven't done that one. So so this um, code I was showing here was was just a demo. So it could be something that just doesn't translate directly to that use case um, based on our our 
code back at FIS. Um, but that's another one maybe, maybe we can talk and I can understand more about your use case and see how, what advice you might have. Okay. Any more questions? So do you guys use like Databricks to stream for path streaming or something else? Uh, yeah, yes. uh, which technology did you say? Databricks. Oh yeah, Databricks. Databricks. Yeah, you guys yeah. use yeah. Databricks. Yes. Okay, so like, if, I mean, if you are running for, uh, I mean, if you are streaming for 30 seconds, then it makes sense to have a long running cluster. But like you said, you are streaming every one hour, right? Like you do a batch streaming of one hour, like, right? Oh yeah, yeah, so with, so with our how, one hour. How do you do that? Like, do you have a scheduler that actually triggers the job, Databricks clusters, or like, you have a long running cluster that just runs every one hour? Oh yeah, so, so the question is with the streaming, um, Happening Based on the one, one hour, hour. In, in aggregates, uh, do we have that cluster running all the time? Was that was that? Correct? Yeah. How are you handling that? Like. Okay. Yeah. That's good. Good question. Yeah. So we have our our kinesis will always bring in the data for us, regardless of the aggregates, because it's just the raw data. Um, we have options here. So the the our metrics that Aaron is referring to are more the metrics inside of our Redshift cluster. Um, we do have structure streaming running all the time to bring that data in and do our our validations, our transformations, and store it into our data lake. Um, but then from there we, we generate our redshift aggregates off of our data lake. So I, I didn't really draw all that in the diagram because I didn't mm -hmm. want to get it too complex, but that's, yeah. that's a so, difference. So you actually, that's a really good point that, that you're kind of going into. The reason why we do it to the hour is that fact of when you're streaming the data in, customers get extremely antsy if it's changing too much and too fast. So we had to look for like this balance of like, okay, we know the data's coming in, we know it's available to you, but how do we make it seem like it's a little bit more static, but also real time at the same time? So it was more arbitrary, like the hour mark seemed like it was. Yeah. Yeah. So we kind of do similar thing, like we have our homegrown MapReduce programs which stream from Kafka every 30 minutes. We are trying to move to Spark streaming for that. So that's why. Yeah, okay. okay. Thank you, last question. Okay. So uh, in the previous slide, so you mentioned about the, uh, the enrichment. Um, I'm just wondering for, for your streaming data, do you do any kind of a, a real-time fraud detection kind of thing? Yeah, so we, we have- By, by real-time, I mean on the second level or at least like a sub-minutes level, yeah, not, so not an hour. Sure, no. yeah, so right now we, we have done that um, sort of as a skunk works project, I guess you could say. Um, we, we don't have that as part of our current production code that we're referring to with hourly aggregates. Um, so with AWS, there's the Kinesis data streams, which would support that use case, but then we also have Kinesis Firehose that allows you to do more of the, the batch um, data as it arrives. Uh, so the, the short answer to your question is we don't do that use case within our team right now, um, but the longer answer is, I guess, that it, it would be supported if we pursued that. But uh, yeah, in the long term, uh, you probably think going that way, do you see any kind of uh, challenge for that? Yeah, so actually one thing that um, uh, Jamie talked on this a bit in the front row, here's our, our coworker. Um, <laughs> uh, one thing that we're working with as well is some um, ML models. And so we do have processes that will regenerate ML models, one that you would use for something like fraud detection. And those are available within the Spark structure streaming job. So if you wanted to do that use case, I think that would probably be the, the angle to take a look at um, to have something updating your, your ML model, but to be able to immediately get your feedback on the fraud detection use case. Okay. All right. Thanks. Well, thank you so much. You uh, thank you, Kevin and Aaron, for your uh, wonderful talk and for coming here. Right. Great. Thank, thank you. Much. A, little, a little something. Oh, very much appreciated. Thank you. Sorry.